very pleased to be here. As you can tell from the title of my presentation, I want to talk about the process of persuasion, a particularly directed process toward um, enhancing pro-environmental action. But persuasion is the area of my study, and Sue, in a previous phone call, asked all of us to talk about how it is that we got interested in studying these processes. And for me, I think it has to do with the fact that all my life, I've been a pushover uh, for the appeals of various kinds of operators and salespeople and fundraisers who would come to my door, and I would find myself in unwanted possession of tickets to the sanitation worker's ball, you know, or a two-year subscription to Jams and Jellies Journal, and I don't even eat toast, you know. And after one of these instances, it occurred to me that I shouldn't just be annoyed by this, I should be intrigued by this. Because after all, I didn't want these things, not on their merits. But somehow I was convinced, I was persuaded to obtain them. It must have been something other than the factors associated with the merits of the case that produced that choice. It must have been something associated with the factors associated with how to present those merits in a psychologically compelling way so that I, I wanted them, at least temporarily. So I thought, well, this is worth studying, not just out of self-defense, uh, but people would be interested in knowing this. What is it about the delivery system for a message, for, a, for a, uh, an option, right, that can increase the likelihood of assent to that message? Right? Um, so uh, I began to take a look at this idea of what was happening outside my door, and, uh, and I, I recognized uh, that one such factor that lends itself to assent, if it's part of the delivery system of a proposal or request or recommendation, is evidence of what a lot of other people, like me, had been doing in that situation. Well, what others around me, like me, had been doing there. In academic parlance, we call this the descriptive social norm. Describes what most other people are doing. In more everyday language, we've called it social proof. Evidence that establishes validity, not through some logical or empirical uh, evidence, but through social evidence. Just the fact that a lot of other people are doing it validates, legitimizes that action. Let me give you an example of one such situation that I just read about not long ago. The city of Louisville was having a problem with uh, people who had various kinds of traffic fines paying their, their fines on time. And so they engaged some behavioral scientists to help them. Those scientists asked them to add one sentence to the typical letter that was sent to these delinquent payers. Right? The sentence was, the majority of citizens do pay their fines on time. And that increased payment by 130% immediately. People take the counsel of what those around them like them are doing to decide what they should do in that situation. Now, not only is this idea of social proof underused, take that example in, in uh, Louisville, where it wasn't the best practice that had evolved in the, the, the government uh, unit to get people to pay their taxes. It required the intervention of a behavioral scientist to say, no, we have something that will do this based on what we know about human 
psychology. Not only is it not always used, sometimes it's misused to the detriment of the people who are trying to send this message. Um, very often, well-intended public service communicators will send out a message regarding an undesirable form of behavior um, <clears throat> that says, so many people are doing this undesirable thing that we have to do something to stop it. We must uh, reduce this problematic uh, behavior. That's wrong-headed. It's what we would call the big mistake. Right? The idea of trying to mobilize people against a particular action by telling them that a lot of people just like them are performing it. Right? Which sends the undercutting normative message, this is what is normal here. This is the norm. Right? So you can see on the screen behind me, this is done for drinking, driving. So many people are drinking and driving. So many people are engaged in tax fraud. So many people are harming the environment. That's wrong-headed. Right? And here's the implication. Within the statement, look at, all the, look at all of the people who are doing this thing wrong, lies the undercutting message. Look at all of the people who are doing it. Right? Wrong-headed. So we decided we would test this uh, possibility. Uh, <clears throat> oh, yeah, so that's the, the message. At um, the... National Petrified uh, Forest Park in Arizona. I live in Arizona. And what exists there is this, uh, the National uh, Petrified Forest Park, that is a national uh, uh, treasure, right? Um, it contains logs, petrified logs, beds of uh, shards and crystals and rocks, that were laid down in the late Triassic period, and that is very attractive to the extent that we get all kinds of visitors coming, like these who are taking pictures, except that some of those visitors don't just take the pictures. They take the fossils. They take the, uh, the artifacts. So much so, and with great frustration, this has caused the administrators to erect this sign outside of the entrance to the park. Your heritage is being val <laughs> uh, vandalized every day by theft losses of petrified wood of 14 tons a year, mostly a small piece at the time. I became aware of this sign when one of my graduate students visited the park with his fiance, who he claimed was the Single most, single most honest person he had ever met in his life. She didn't ever refrain from returning a rubber band or paper clip that she had borrowed. And as they were standing in front of this sign, he was shocked to hear her whisper, we'd better get ours too. <laughs> Now, what could, that, what could turn this otherwise scrupulously honest young woman into an environmental criminal with designs on looting a national treasure in the process? It was the process of social proof woefully mispurchased, mispurposed. Right? The message is all of the, the, the visitors are doing it. Right? And it legitimized that. So we decided to see if we could test this idea. So we went to the park, and they have various paths. Typically, over a long period of time, the average number of visitors who steal wood from the forest floor is about 2.9 um, per, uh, 2.95%. Well, we had two signs that we erected during, on some of these paths. One sign imitating the sign from the uh, administrators 
was show, urging people not to take wood and showing a number of people doing so. That increased theft by almost two and a half percent. But we had another side. Instead of normalizing the behavior, it showed one individual. In, in other words, we, mar we marginalized it, and that merely halved theft. So what's our, our takeaway here? If you ever have a message where you're trying to move people away from an undesirable behavior, it's a mistake to tell them that a lot of people are doing it, and we have to change that. We tell them that if even one person drinks and drives... It undermines our safety. If even one person litters, it undermines the environment. If even one person takes a piece of wood from the forest floor, it undermines the integrity of the, uh, of the forest. Okay, well, that's fine. But what, what could we do to harness this, this principle, this powerful principle, especially in a way that would help with this larger question of how do we persuade people to be more environmentally friendly? With a couple of uh, estimable comment, uh, uh, co colleagues, we went to a uh, suburb of San Diego and um, put door hangers, one of four types of door hangers, on the doors of residents there. Three of the door hangers use standard appeals for uh, reducing energy conservation in the home, uh, for increasing energy conversation in the home. One said, do this for the environment. Another sign, what, another hanger said, do this for, as a matter of social responsibility for future generations so they'll have resources. The third said, do this for your Economic well-being, it'll reduce your, your power bill if you reduce your energy conservation. And the fourth said, do this because we've done a survey, and we actually did, and the majority of your neighbors try to reduce energy conservation. So then we had our undergraduate research assistants go into their yards, read their, their meters at risk of barking dogs and rogue water systems, and uh, I'm happy to report to you that no undergraduates were harmed or sacrificed <laughs> in the conduct of this research. But here's what we found. Right? This is control groups, those people who either didn't get a door hanger once a month, once a week for a month, or got a door hanger that just said, please don't do this. Those two controls were equivalent. In other words, exhort, exhorting people to conserve energy had the same effect as nothing. People needed reasons. Well, let's see what the reasons did in reducing energy conservation. Environmental protection, a small deflection, same with benefit to society, same with saving money. But social proof, three and a half times as powerful an effect. Okay, how do we scale this up to a national societal level, right, rather than just publishing this result? It happened to me because two young entrepreneurs, Dan Yates, uh, Alice Glasky, were, were starting a new company called O-Power, where they were going to partner with um, utilities to send people every month, an accounting of how they were doing relative to their neighbors, not just how they were doing relative to last month, how they were doing relative to their neighbors in conserving energy. And the, it looked like this. It wasn't any neighbor, it was comparable neighbors. Neighbors just like you, same footprint, same kind of heating and air conditioning system, proximity and so on. So we were able to harness a special kind of persuasion that I'm going to call per persuasion. Not just persuasion, persuasion. Right? And uh, let me show you what happened 
uh, in terms of the first 10 years of sending these messages about how you compare to your... Right? It has saved in 10 years $700 million per year in the country because there's now 100 utilities who are doing this. It saved 23 trillion watts per hour of electricity. And here's my favorite. It prevented more than 36 billion pounds of carbon dioxide from entering our environment. Billion pounds of a gas. Big effects. So how did I get here? From, from hanging door, door hangers in San Diego and putting signs up in the National Petrified Forest to this. It required a partnership with, as a social scientist, an institution I would have never dreamed of partnering with, the private sector. Not as a social scientist. I know life scientists, physical scientists, so on, atmospheric They will partner with... Never had done so. If I'm ever going to undertake a research project where I want to scale things up, I won't make that mistake again. Because it was the partnership with O-Power that generated 36 billion pounds of savings. Otherwise, it would have shown up as an entry on my CV. And that's all. And I think that would have been a regrettable uh, trade-off. So thank you very much for your time. Time for one question. Oh, we have somebody, a taker. You know we have a lot of problems with anti-vaxxers, people who don't want to take yeah. the COVID-19 vaccine. What would you tell them? I'll tell them something that we have done in our most recent research. It's to show them the trend of people just like them who have been taking the vaccine. And there is such a trend. That trend works because of a classic human response, uh, uh, a tendency to project the function, the trend function into the future. So you will get people who, if you say 30% of individuals uh, like you are now are now uh, being vaccinated, they can do the math and they see that 70% are not. So it's a mistake. But if you say, last year it was 15%. Six months ago it was 20%. Now it's 30%. You get a big spike in adoption because they can project it into the future. That's what we found. One one more question, since we're having such a good time. Thanks. Um, I believe that, <clears throat> excuse me, the real estate uh, and agents knew this uh, for at least 40 years ago. When we first bought a house, they said, oh, there's a couple just like you who are looking at this house. Right. Next house, they said, oh, there's a couple just like you who want to start a family, and so they want a bigger house. Yes. Okay. And the third time we started hearing about the mirror image couple, I said, <laughs> I don't want to hear about the mirror image couple. If they exist... They can have the house, and that cut it off. So that brings up the question, is, is, are these uh, statements that the private sector is willing to put forth, are they true or not? It sounds like with the COVID example, you're saying something that is true. Yes. But I wondered with some of the others with the... With no, the, uh, this is a graduate level question. Okay. This is exactly <laughs> what I would have been worried about. And the key is you, you cannot manufacture or counterfeit any of this information or what just happened to you happens to the source of the information. They lose all credibility. Nobody's going to believe anything they say, even if it's honest after that. So you point to things that are truly in the situation. You can bring to consciousness and engage a, a factor that does steer people in the right direction. Thank you again.